Jada used 240 to pass her FTCE professional education exams. She writes that our study guides were thorough, understandable, and adaptable to every learning style. Nice job, Jada. My name's Jessica Solano, and I've worked in education in Florida for about 14 years. And in 2017, I was Florida Teacher of the Year. I've been able to partner with 240 to help teachers in Florida, and today, I'm gonna help you. This video is gonna prepare you for the FTCE Professional Education Test. That's test code number 083. And this video is gonna cover three things. What's on the test and how to study for it, the biggest concepts that you'll need to know, and we're gonna do a few practice questions at the end. This test is a vital step on every Florida teacher's path to certification. It's a test about how to teach, so it's kind of a big deal. The FTCE Professional Education Test consists of eight competencies. Wow, those are long names for competencies. Let's try the bite-sized version. Much better. This exam covers planning instruction, learning environments, delivering instruction, types of assessment, professional improvement, professional conduct, teaching English language learners, and literacy strategies. The test is approximately 100 multiple choice questions in all, and each competency is worth between 7 and 18% of the exam. For each competency, let's discuss one thing that you have to know. We'll start with the competencies worth the largest percentage of the exam. Let's discuss competency one, which is all about designing and planning instruction. Now there's a lot that goes into this, but do you know a great way to help your students bloom into stronger thinkers? Using Bloom's Taxonomy. Bloom's Taxonomy is used to classify educational learning objectives into levels of complexity and specificity. It provides a framework for educators as they plan their lessons. The levels are modeled as a pyramid, starting with foundational skills at the base and increasing in rigor as they work their way up that particular skill or concept. The different levels have verbs associated with them to assist the educator in identifying the level of a task. In other words, the focus is on what is the student doing? We have them covered for you, along with everything else you need to know for your exam in our 240 study guide. You know all that excellent instruction you have planned? Now let's talk about delivering it. This is the other biggie, worth 18% of your score. So you'll need to know all of the ins and outs of delivering high quality instruction to all students all the time. A lot of these questions wanna be sure that you're stimulating your students' higher order thinking abilities. But most importantly, make sure your instruction is age appropriate. Meet students where they are and push them to be just a bit better every single day. Then make sure you're changing up your instructional techniques. Ask students to discuss a topic, allowing space and respect for a variety of viewpoints. Allow students to discover new content through inquiry or have students work through difficult problems, either alone or with their peers. The biggest thing here is to keep switching it up. Keep students interested in what's coming up next. Need a little bit more help understanding how and why to vary the instruction in your classroom? We've got lots of suggestions in our study guides. Now, where are you gonna deliver this top-notch instruction you got planned? Let's talk about learning environments. This is covered in competency two. A big part of creating a successful learning environment for students is managing behavior. This is bound to come up on your exam. Let me tell you, no matter what subject or what grade level, you'll get plenty of opportunities to manage behavior. A teacher's best bet is to take a proactive approach by trying to prevent problem behaviors from occurring in the first place. To take a proactive approach to behavior management, teachers can establish clear expectations from the very beginning. Try seeking students' input about class behavior expectations. That way you can develop their sense of ownership and responsibility. Establish incentives and consequences and implement them consistently. Want to hear another really great tip to help you both in the classroom and on the exam? Let's take a peek inside our study guide. If minor incidents do occur, try to address them immediately. Students may need their focus redirected. Sometimes a simple nonverbal reminder, like a knowing look, will do. The less class time interrupted, the better. Okay guys, we've planned and delivered instruction in a student-centered learning environment. Now let's assess the impact on student learning. There are tons of different ways to assess students and you're gonna need to be familiar with just about all of them. So you'll want to know formal assessment, informal assessment, formative and summative, criterion referenced, norm referenced, curriculum based, performance based, universal screeners, diagnostic assessments, 
pre-tests, post-tests, how to progress monitor, and the list just goes on and on. I'm not doing the Bueller, Bueller, Bueller joke. Ben Stein owes me money. Anyway, I know it's a lot, but don't worry, we've got you. Let's take a look at how the videos in our study guide help walk you through just a couple of these assessment types. Now let's talk about the differences between formative and summative assessment. Formative assessments are assessments for learning. They are used to guide instruction, meaning they're administered to assess students' progress toward meeting a learning objective, so teachers can adjust instruction as needed. They help teachers answer the question, what do I teach next? Summative assessments are assessments of learning. They are used to gauge instruction by determining whether or not students mastered a learning objective. Teachers use them to answer the question, what did my students learn? Meaning, what do they know now or what are they able to do? So remember, formative assessment informs instruction toward the learning objective, while summative assessment sums up students' performance on the learning objective. Ooh, informal versus formal assessment comes up a lot. But remember, those are just two of the assessment types that you're gonna see on the test. To review them all, you gotta check out our study guide. Let's keep our focus on teaching students. Then we'll wrap up with our professionalism competencies at the end. This category is all about supporting our English language learners, or ELLs, by designing instruction and assessments that are relevant to them and meet their needs. You'll need to be familiar with relating culture and cultural identities to your curriculum the stages of first and second language literacy acquisition, and differentiating instruction and making accommodations on assessments when necessary. I'm gonna give you some tips about accommodations that you can make for ELLs during classroom instruction. But if you aren't confident in each of those other concepts, because you need to be, gotta use the 240 study guide. The 240 guarantee means that you get your money back if you don't pass. Now for those accommodations. It's important to remember that English language learners should not receive different content. They should receive linguistically supported content. Here are three ways to support ELLs during classroom instruction through scaffolding and comprehensible input. First, teachers should provide visuals when teaching new content. Of course, this could mean showing pictures of what you're teaching, but visuals can also include gestures or hand motions that can help your students understand your lesson or your directions. They can also include classroom displays, like word walls, for students to refer to. Next, teachers should provide support specifically with vocabulary. A good strategy is teaching key terms before the lesson to give ELLs some necessary background knowledge. You can also provide reference materials for them to use, such as word banks. Choosing the correct term from a short list of choices is an example of scaffolding while students are learning new terms. Finally, you can make some adjustments to how you deliver your lesson. Use nonverbal cues like pointing, slow down when speaking, and pause occasionally. Use straightforward language. Stay away from things like idioms to avoid confusion. You know, an idiom is a common expression that means something different than what the word literally means. Okay, so let's call it a day on accommodations for ELLs. It was a piece of cake, right? Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah, don't use this when you're teaching ELLs. You're doing great so far. It's time for the next competency. Here you'll get questions about how to develop students' reading skills across all content areas. For now, let's focus on how to build students' reading comprehension. I'm talking about comprehending any text in any content area. There are strategies that you can use before, during, and after reading to increase students' understanding. Before reading, it's a good idea to preview the text. Examine the structure, the features, or the pictures. Let students make predictions. During reading, use a graphic organizer. There are organizational tools used for representing the content of a text visually, mapping the structure of a text, or making connections between ideas. Some examples are sequencing maps, concept maps, and Venn diagrams. After reading, you can teach students to summarize the content. Students should be able to pull together important information from the text and then put it into their own words by paraphrasing. Teachers should scaffold summarizing skills to focus students on including only the main points rather than all of those in-depth details. You can give prompts to help them with this. For example, students could be given a framework like somebody, wanted, but, so, then, to generate a summary. 
For example, if this video was a text, we could summarize it like this. Somebody, you, wanted to pass your FTC exam, but if you weren't sure where to start, so you watched this video and checked out 240, and then you were prepared to pass the test. Okay, that's it for the literacy strategies. Let's move on to the next competency. Here we'll talk about professional improvement. I know, you're a new teacher and you already have to start improving? Well, as the name implies, the most important thing to know here is professional development, or PD for short. When answering questions, these are the steps they want you to follow. First, make sure data is being used to find the issue, which is often a learning gap. Then make a measurable goal. This basically means that you can use data to evaluate the change. Next, pick your professional development and make sure it's backed by current research. After you've implemented it, reassess your students to see if you've closed that gap. Other best practices involve using self-reflection to consider where to improve. Make sure your plans are relevant to your classroom. This goes hand in hand with the next one, improving in places that will have the biggest impact on your students and yourself. And finally, collaborating with other educators. For example, observe veteran teachers and use them as a mentor. Okay, let's chat through our final competency. Time for professional conduct. About half of this competency is on the Florida Principles of Professional Conduct, the official laws that govern being a teacher. You'll also have some best practices and legal questions about using technology. Now, these technology questions can be less obvious to new teachers, so let's go there. Overall, it's safety first. Questions will make sure you will be protecting students and the campus itself. But what does that mean? Well, here are some best practices. First, because of FERPA, student data needs to stay private to the students and their parents. This means you cannot post a list of students' grades with the student's name on it on the wall. Second, keep equity in mind. If you're assigning online homework, you're gonna to have to make sure all students have technology and internet connection needed to complete it. All software, including online programs, have terms of service, which are rules that you need to follow. And last, viruses. These are bits of computer code that infect computers and can compromise student and staff data and security. Viruses require downloads, so be very wary of any email attachments. I'm looking at you, camera guy. You download those sketchy attachments, don't you? Now that we've gone over some of the big concepts in our eight competencies, let's take a look at some practice questions and show you how some of those concepts might appear on the test. Now, if you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test below. At the end, you get a score report on how well you did on the test. That way, you know what to study. Did I mention the 240 study guide has a money back guarantee that you'll pass? It's pretty awesome. Now for the questions. Remember the competency about instructional design? Let's look at a question about that one. Mr. Williams is using backward design to plan the research unit. Which of the following would be the most logical first step in this planning process? This is the best choice. Creating the grading expectations or the rubric for the research product would be an important first step in the backward design of the unit. This would ensure that all of the state expectations are being considered when planning the lead up activities. Now let's look at one on learning environments. Mrs. Hill notices her students have a hard time staying focused as she walks around the room answering students' questions. She knows the students need to stay focused to maximize their learning. So which of the following would be the best strategy for Mrs. Hill to implement? This is the one we want. This is the best answer because it clarifies those classroom expectations and it promotes an environment in which students can focus. What about those tricky higher order thinking questions? What do those look like? What is the primary benefit of a teacher working with a student to think about the step-by-step -step causes of a problem and the possible solutions? Well, at first glance, a lot of these look like pretty good choices. And just about all of these might be benefits, but the question asks about the primary benefit. So the best answer is this one. Having students think through problems and their causes allows the students to develop problem-solving strategies. These strategies can apply to multiple situations. Here's a question from Competency 7, teaching English language learners. Mr. Martin is planning an instructional unit and wants to adjust the lesson to meet the needs of English language learners, or ELLs, in his class. Each student has a varying level of English proficiency. What is the best strategy to adjust the instructional unit to meet the student's needs? 
allow the ELL students to work together during group activities to promote English proficiency. Adjust the content to make the presentation and homework assignments simpler to accommodate varying language proficiencies. Make dictionaries accessible to the students and allow for additional time to complete the assignments while other students can work independently. Or send the ELL student to the resource room for supplemental instructions during presentations. This is the correct answer. By allowing students a dictionary and additional time, the teacher is adjusting instruction to meet the needs of the ELL students while promoting English proficiency and grade level appropriate content. And let's go to competency eight, literacy strategies. Students are instructed to write a summary of a section of the story they've just finished reading. Before being able to summarize, students first must be able to develop self-monitoring skills and identify the traits of the characters, delete extraneous information and determine main idea, highlight the subheadings and identify the traits of the characters, or list all of the details along with the subheadings. This is the right choice. When writing a summary, students should be able to first delete extraneous or redundant information and then determine the main idea. Next up, professional development. Mr. Tomlin is a first year teacher who wants to improve his classroom management. Which of the following would be the best strategy for Mr. Tomlin to improve his classroom management skills? Use online resources to find the best classroom management techniques. Discuss his current strategies with the principal and ask the principal for guidance in improving his classroom management skills. Observe the classroom management abilities of other first year teachers. Or observe experienced teachers in the classroom and discuss classroom management skills when students leave the class. This last one is correct. Remember the best practices. Collaboration with veteran teachers is always a good move. Now lastly, professional conduct. A third grade teacher sends a monthly newsletter and includes a note that students reading benchmark data reports are now available and will be sent home the following week in students' folders. One of the parents replies and asks if they can be sent an electronic copy instead. What's the best way for the teacher to respond? Choice B is best. Asking for an electronic copy is a reasonable request so the teacher can honor this request and protect the student's personally identifiable information by password protecting the document before sending it to the parent. Choices A and D don't secure the student's data, and C just isn't professional. Now that's just a small sampling of practice questions to give you an idea about how these concepts are assessed on the test. Congratulations, you have finished the video. If you found it helpful, give it a like, there's still plenty more to learn. And did you know that there's thousands of teachers that have passed their certification tests using our study guides? If you really wanna make sure that you're prepared for that FTCE professional education exam, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 study guide. It has hours of video, so you can watch or listen when it's convenient for you. It's test aligned, so you know precisely what you need to study. And it has hundreds of practice questions, so you can be sure you're absolutely ready. And best of all, it has that money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started.